Make sure to use code BANGLE at sign up on FanDuel for a $20 deposit bonus. And check out my second channel for other games coming up like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Call of Duty Black Ops 4. As well as my third channel with collaborations with some of your favorite YouTubers. Let's get into the video. What's going on guys? Bangle again here coming back at you with another video today. Doing another mock draft video. Last time I did a way too early mock draft as I did last year. Of course, now coming back at you as you can tell from the title with a too early mock draft as i record this it is about mid-december just before week 15 of the 2018 nfl season and i have decided to build another mock draft an update to my last one so without further ado let's go ahead jump right into it the draft order has changed from my last one significantly so things should be interesting at number one i have the san francisco 49ers going nick bosa an edge rusher out of ohio state Arguably the best player in this entire class, so I think it's fitting that he would go number one in the draft. San Fran, obviously in need of an edge rusher. Solomon Thomas, I think, has played better each year, but nowhere up to his draft pick, and you have to start looking to get better at a serious positional weakness. And I know what you might say. Cassius Marsh has played all right. Solomon Thomas has played all right. Ronald Blair has played all right. You don't really have a true edge rusher in there. Eric Armstead is more suited to play the inside with DeForest Buckner, who's been incredible. Honestly, Solomon Thomas, to me, would fit better in a 3-4 than a 4-3. You need a true 4-3 edge rusher if that's the defense that you're going to stick to and that looks like the 49ers are going to. Nick Bosa certainly fills a need, fits the bill. If they're picking at number one, obviously you don't need a quarterback with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think they go the best edge rusher available, and that is Nick Bosa. At number two, I have the Arizona Cardinals selecting Greedy Williams, cornerback out of LSU. Had him a lot further down in my last mock draft. But as you, I run through these picks, as you go through these picks, each position, each player, their value changes so drastically based on the team picking before them. And it's so important when you do these mock drafts to not try to scheme fit players that fit these teams so well if a team in front of them might want to get them. So... Even though Greedy Williams went outside the top 10 of my last one, I have him going all the way up to two now, you have to look at the positions of need for the Arizona Cardinals. Their offensive line is terrible, but they also don't have a true number two cornerback next to Patrick Peterson. Not at all. So it was between cornerback and an offensive line for me. I don't think that they're going to look to go Jonah Williams or Greg Little. I don't think there's a true stud offensive lineman that leaps out, you know, to go in the top five like that. For a team like the Cardinals picking at number two, I know I have an offensive lineman at number five and then six, but I don't think they're going to view it as that. I think they're going to see Greedy as a fantastic top three talent, and they're not going to want to pass up on him. Greedy Williams at LSU to the Cardinals as the Raiders take Ed Oliver. Then hearing his stock dropping quite a bit, but he really flashes on tape. His athleticism is incredible. I do compare him to Aaron Donald with that athletic profile. He is an incredible player that just has to work on technique. He's powerful. He's quick at the point of attack. He's a really aggressive, strong, powerful, impactful player. And if you're picking inside the top three, as the Raiders are, terrible team this year, you're looking to get one of those impact playmakers. And on the defensive line this year, it looks like you can't miss. Ed Oliver, in my opinion, is a can't-miss player. He would be at number one or number two on my entire big board. be coming out with a video on that as we get closer to the draft, so make sure to subscribe for that if you're new. But Ed Oliver to the Raiders, they need help on the interior. Maurice Hurst is really good. Ed Oliver offers you versatility and just a stud player at this position, at this spot, number three in the entire draft, as the Falcons take Quinnen Williams. Grady Jarrett is an impending free agent, but more so than that, they don't really have another guy. They don't at all. Quinnen Williams is a very, very good player in this class. Another guy that I view kind of as a can't-miss player. Could play nose, could play traditional 4-3 defensive tackle, 3-4 defensive end maybe in the right package. And the Falcons need that interior pass rush and that run stuff that Quinn and Williams can offer you, in my opinion. Another can't-miss player here in the top five. Number five, first offensive tackle off the board, that is Jonah Williams. All SEC player out of the University of Alabama. Really solid player. In my opinion, the safest offensive tackle in this class. Greg Little, I have concerns about. Jawan Taylor, I have concerns about, although I think they both will be first-round picks. Jonah Williams 
helps the Jets out significantly. Their offensive line has not been fantastic this year, especially when you consider the fact that they have a young quarterback in Sam Darnold and not a lot of talent surrounding him. They need to get better on the offense side of the ball, and protecting their young quarterback should be a priority. Jonah Williams to the Jets at number five as another New York team. The only true team that actually plays in New York, in Western uh, New York, that is the Buffalo Bills. I have them taking Greg Little. Another situation where this team has a young quarterback, not a lot of offensive talent. They need to protect him. It should be a priority, in my opinion. It will be. Bills take Greg Little, offensive tackle at Ole Miss. Here's an interesting one. The Jacksonville Jaguars at number seven. And they take a quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, out of Ohio State. You guys know my opinion about Dwayne Haskins, probably. If you don't, real quick, I think he's a talented player with a high ceiling that's very raw right now. I don't think he's a first-round talent, although I think that he will go in the first round. A lot of hype in a weak quarterback class, especially if Justin Herbert doesn't come out. Dwayne Haskins very well could be the first quarterback off the board. I think right now, he's probably moved up to a second or third-round grade as a player. However, in a weak QB class with teams that need a quarterback, they're going to reach up the board and they're going to take them. And I don't think that Dwayne Haskins is a bad player. I just think he's raw. I think he should go back to Ohio State and get better for another season. But if you're getting that first round hype, you're probably going to end up declaring. So I think Dwayne Haskins will declare. And I think the Jaguars will end up taking him in the top 10 if they have the opportunity. As we wrap up, the top eight here with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers taking Cleveland Farrell. An edge rusher out of Clemson. One of my favorite players in the draft. Love Cleveland Farrell. He's a guy that's been a starter at Clemson as a true freshman, and he was incredible. Love Cleveland Farrell. He's an impact playmaker in both the run game, but especially getting after the quarterback as a pass rusher. And I know he didn't play a whole ton um, as a freshman. It's with that redshirt freshman role in 2015. Um, only played a game, so he kept his redshirt and then played as a redshirt freshman. Uh, and was an impact playmaker, 12 and a half tackles for loss, six sacks, and then his sack totals, his tackles for loss totals have only improved as a player at Clemson. He obviously benefits from playing on an insanely talented defensive line with Christian Wilkins, who's entering this draft, with Dexter Lawrence, who's entering this draft, with Austin Bryant, who's entering this draft. He's played on, in my opinion, the most talented defensive line in football, even if it hasn't performed up to the best. Alabama's another one that's incredible. But the best four players on the defensive line for Clemson um it's the most talented group per position if you guys get what I'm saying so he has benefit from that but he's still an incredibly talented player in his own right I wouldn't take anything away from him and with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers you go ahead and you look at their depth chart and they do have Jason Pierre-Paul who's played fairly well this year his sack totals are high I don't think he's played up to that level if that makes sense I don't think he's played up to his double digit sacks I think a lot of them have been schemed and a lot of them have been uh, situational which there is a value to that but especially with him getting up there in age you're going to need to look to improve and even with Jason Pierre Paul playing well you don't really have an answer on the other side in my opinion Carl Nassib has played well Vinny Curry in my opinion is more of an interior player he's not really a true edge rusher neither is William Golston Noah Spence has not been consistent for you you need to get a true number one edge rusher. And if you're at number eight and there's a player like this on the board, you have to take him in my opinion. Bucks obviously could go cornerback as well or a number of different positions, but I think that edge rusher is too much value as we move on here from nine to 16 as the Lions are on the board and they take Josh Allen, one of my favorite players of this entire draft, a versatile guy that I have listed as outside linebacker. I think he can play edge in a 4-3 or a 3-4. I think he can play outside linebacker in a 4-3. I think he can play inside linebacker in a 4-3 or 3-4. I think this is a guy that can literally do it all. Such a talented player out of Kentucky. Another guy that's just improved every single year. He was a fringe first-round talent for me last year. He is absolutely a first-round talent this year. I have him in the top five for my early big board a few months ago, and he has certainly proven to fit the bill on that. Josh Allen has been incredible for the Wildcats, and they have been very lucky to have him. The Detroit Lions get themselves a stud here in the top 10. Now my favorite team, the New York Football Giants. Of course, a lot of people want the Giants to take a quarterback, and maybe the top QB is already off the board as the Jags took Dwayne Haskins. Do you reach down the board for Drew Locke? 
in this weak quarterback class? Do you take Will Greer here, or do you wait until the second round? And maybe Drew Locke falls to you. Maybe Will Greer's available. Maybe you take Easton Stick, who I love out of North Dakota State. Maybe you take Orion Finley, or, you know, there are so many different options, and I don't think there are any true standouts at this point. And I know a lot of players are going to like these different guys. A lot of players are going to say, hey, Will Greer's the best quarterback in this class. Drew Locke's the best quarterback in this class. Ryan Finley's great. Clayton Thorson's great. Jared Stidham, maybe, you think. Um, Shea Patterson, for what it's worth. And Daniel Jones, even out of Duke, is a really good quarterback. He has a lot of potential. But I don't think either of these guys are top 10 talents. And when you have a player like Devin White, in my opinion, that is a can't-miss player, another top five talent, still available, still on the board, I think you have to take him. Really, really talented player at LSU, highly recruited as a running back, and then changed to linebacker, and he's been one of the best players in the entire T of college football. And he's still learning the position. He's a guy that's been impactful as an edge player in certain packages, and he's been incredible as an inside linebacker, a three-down linebacker with good coverage ability. Really, really talented player. And the Giants haven't really had a dominant inside linebacker since Antonio Pierce, and that was only for a couple of years back 10 years ago. The Giants need to get better at inside linebacker. It is a huge, huge position to need. It's a huge weakness. And despite Alec Ogletree getting a couple of tipped interceptions, same thing with B.J. Goodson and people probably overvaluing them, they are not good players. Devin White is a good player. Giants cannot miss here. They need to take an impact player. Devin White is that guy. They're so bad on the defensive side of the ball. I know they're bad on offense as well. Their offensive line is bad. They could take Juwan Taylor here, but... In my opinion, they go Devin White. And the Bengals take Jawan Taylor with the next pick at number 11. Impact playmaker out of Florida. He's had a good season. Risen up draft boards. Checked out the tape on him. And he's a player that's very strong at the point of attack. Very good footwork for a player of his size. And he's a guy that probably will accelerate up draft boards. I don't see him in a lot of first rounds right now. But I think he will end up getting that hype. So, top 15 at a position of need, one of the most valuable positions in football, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bengals go offensive line. As the Packers, all the way up at number 12, already eliminated from playoff contention. It's wild how bad they've been this year. And a big reason for that is they haven't had consistency off the edge. Nick Perry and Clay Matthews both are getting older. And it looks like Kyler Fackrell has been your best edge rusher as of late. And that's a problem. That's a problem. I know people think Kyler Fackrell is really underrated, and he has played well in this new system. He has eight sacks on the year, and he has played well because he didn't get any pressure on the quarterback um, a year or two ago. This is new for him, and he's playing great. He really is, but you need something else coming off the edge. With Clay Matthews and Nick Perry being big question marks, if they're going to be in the future of the Green Bay Packers or not, you need to get better, and I think a very, very talented, underrated player out of Boston College in Zach Allen could fit exactly that need. As the Browns are on the board at number 13, and they take Nikhil Harry out of Arizona State, a player I didn't include in the first round of my last mock draft, and that's not because I don't think he's very good. It was just based off the picks and based off of what was available. When you look at Nikhil Harry on tape, a number of things will stand out for you. His jump ball ability is right up there, and he has a surprising elusiveness factor. He has a can you know a can make you miss type attribute to him, and he is good. The only concerns I really have for him is how quick is he off the snap? I think he has generally good release, but he's not a quick burst player. He's not a guy that I think is going to be a playmaker on slants. And to me, he's a overall less athletic Mike Williams. And Mike Williams has started to play really really well this year, but. I don't think he's as good as Mike Williams, and that's who I would compare him to, Nikhil Harry. So, there are question marks with him. I could easily see him not going in the first round, but the Browns need a true number one, as I would say. And to me, Nikhil Harry does fit the mold on that as a true number one wide receiver. They have a lot of guys that are decent. Jarvis Landry, decent. He's solid, but he's not a true number one receiver. He's more of a effective slot receiver kind of the same thing with Antonio Callaway who's been inconsistent this year and then the next guy that you're throwing to has been Rashard Higgins and then Brashad Perriman Brashad Perriman can't catch and that's a big problem when you're playing receiver and 
he has started to play better. His hands have developed here with the Browns in a limited uh, number of attempts or limited number of appearances. He's a guy that only has four career touchdowns and he has five catches in the past three weeks. And they've been big strike catches too. So you kind of wonder what his value is. And I think a lot of that is Baker Mayfield playing as well as he has and making players like Brashad Perriman look decent. They don't have a true number one. I think Nikhil Harry can certainly fill the need there, certainly be an impact playmaker for you. And I keep using that term, but that's what you're looking for in the first round. You're looking for those players that are going to come in and make an immediate impact. And Nikhil Harry as a jump ball receiver that can go up and get it for Baker Mayfield. I think that is an incredible value as we move on to the Redskins at number 14. they take Cody Ford, and I have him listed at offensive line. He's a guy that plays right tackle currently at Oklahoma, yet I think this is a guy that can move inside. Right guard, left guard, can potentially even play left tackle for you. I'd love him to play guard, and the Redskins are a team that's weak, particularly on the offensive line. Their defensive line's incredible. Offensive line, not so much. They don't really have a left guard or a center, Morgan Moses at right tackle is inconsistent, and Trent Williams is getting up there in age, and injuries have been a problem for him over this latter half of his career. So you got to wonder, at what point did you go out there and you try to improve that offensive line for whoever your quarterback happens to be? They could take a QB here. Same reason they don't have the Giants taking a quarterback. There isn't a true first-round player on the board right now, and they say, all right, we got to protect our quarterback, whoever it might be. Let's go ahead and get an offensive line. Let's protect whoever that quarterback is. Cody Ford, versatile offensive lineman. Probably won't play center for you, but there are a lot of versatile offensive linemen in this class maybe later on. Elgin Jenkins out of Mississippi State could potentially play left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle. Very versatile. You got to wonder, is this going to be a draft for the Redskins where they really go full offensive line? Look for a quarterback in free agency. Maybe Joe Flacco is going to be there. Maybe you can somehow get Teddy Bridgewater. Do you have to draft a quarterback? Not so sure on that one. I have them going Cody Ford, offensive line here out of Oklahoma. As the Panthers go, Deontay Thompson. What a season he's had at the University of Alabama this past season. And you'll see a trend. There are a lot of Alabama players in this class because Alabama is incredible. Their team is so good. They have so many talented players. And a lot of them aren't even draft eligible yet. And they have so many draft-eligible players. I could see at least five going in the first round. And that seems so crazy to say. But when you look at their defensive line, Raquan Davis, Quinn and Williams, when you look at their offensive line with Jonah Williams, he'll be a player that goes first round. When you look at Deontay Thompson, when you look at Trayvon Diggs, a cornerback, when you look maybe at Mac Wilson, inside linebacker out of Alabama, I mean, they have so many players that do have that ability to go first round. Maybe see Anthony Jennings rise up boards. I mean, there are so many players here that could go first round. And, and it's crazy how good their receivers have been. Their offense, they don't really even have draft eligible players on that side of the ball. You look at Jerry Judy. You look at Najee Harris. You look at some of these guys, Henry Ruggs, Tua Tunga Vailoa. Uh, these players are not even draft eligible yet. So it's going to be a crazy draft for them next year, I'm sure. But we're talking about the Panthers right now. They need help so badly in the secondary and I don't think they're going to go cornerback I think they're going to be satisfied with what James Bradbury has brought to them and that doesn't mean they're overjoyed with how well that he's played but I think they're going to be satisfied with his performance you went wide receiver last year in the first round with DJ Moore he's played well for you and you took Dante Jackson in the first round two years ago and your cornerbacks I think you'll be satisfied although not overjoyed and then you look to their safeties Eric Reed has not been the same player with the concussion issues, not the same player he was with the 49ers in his rookie season. Mike Adams is maybe 50 or 60 years old right now playing safety. Probably not the best. And then outside of that, you don't really have anything at safety. Deontay Thompson is a bona fide stud that can cover, that can come down in the box and hit. Really versatile player, can play free safety or strong safety for the Panthers, in my opinion. And that versatility is going to up his value Panthers certainly need help there in that secondary. Fills a need for sure as another big need. Philadelphia Eagles at cornerback. Maybe the worst starting positional group in the entire NFL. The Eagles need a cornerback desperately. 
and then they need another cornerback, and then they need a, another cornerback. Rasul Douglas has played well, considering he's Rasul Douglas. Probably shouldn't be starting on a team. Sidney Jones, injury concerns, but he's been all right. But again, he's playing injured, and, and even if he's if he's not playing, and he's out for the year now, I mean, injuries continue to be an issue for him. And then you have Cravon LeBlanc. Devontae Bosby was covering Odell Beckham Jr. when the Giants played the Eagles. Devontae Bosby. Think about that for a minute. Devontae Bosby was your number one corner for a game. That is bad. Now you go and you take an award-winning cornerback out of Georgia. You improve your secondary drastically with just one player because when you're talking about cornerbacks... You're talking about players that shut down one side of the field completely when they're playing at their best. And DeAndre Baker for Georgia has been that guy. He's been an incredible cornerback. And now, I don't think he has the athletic profile that Greedy Williams has, and I think that will hurt his value. But he's played probably a more technical and better cornerback than Greedy Williams has played for LSU. So this is a guy that should absolutely go in the first round. I would not be shocked if he went in the top 10. Have him here in the top 16 or the top half of the draft. Good player. And really, at the end of the day, it fills a huge need for the Eagles. Now at 17, there goes a quarterback. Broncos take Drew Locke. They need a quarterback badly. Case Keenum isn't getting it done. Drew Locke could be the best quarterback available at this point. I think the Broncos, like they did with Paxton Lynch, say, all right, this player... Maybe not a first-round guy. We need them. We're going to take him. We'll take the risk. We'll take the chance. Drew Locke to the Broncos at number 17. As the Miami Dolphins, another team that could be looking quarterback, go wide receiver, and that is A.J. Brown. And I know they signed Albert Wilson, who's had injury concerns, but I really do think they need help at that position. I don't think they're in love with Leonte Carew. I don't think they're in love with Kenny Stills. I think they need to go out there and improve that positional group. Could also look for them to go edge rusher here. Offensive line as well. They don't really have a great guard, but I think guard's a position you can address later. Wide receiver's been a position where they need help. It can't be Danny Amendola. They don't like Devontae Parker. Jakeem Grant is a special teams player. And even though a lot of people, some people might consider this to be a strength for the Dolphins, I think it isn't. I think they need to go wide receiver at some point in the first three rounds. And why not take maybe the best receiver in the entire class, A.J. Brown, if he's available at number 18. Colts go defensive line at number 19. This is such a talented defensive tackle class. But when I was going up here, going down the list, and giving you know teams these players, I'm struggling to land some of these defensive tackles in spots. And I think that teams, knowing how talented this defensive tackle class is, might not jump at the opportunity to take a defensive tackle if they know they can get a really talented player in the second round. Because think about it this way. If you like a player 100% and you have to take him, if he's available at 15, maybe you take him. Or if you like a player 97% and he's available in the second round when you pick, maybe you wait for that to happen. And I don't know if you guys fully understand what I'm saying there, but if you can get a player who's you, you like almost exactly as much later in the draft, you're going to do that. But that's why guys like Derek Brown have fallen for me. That's why guys like Rashawn Gary have fallen. Jeffrey Simmons, same deal. Guys like Jerry Tillery, spoiler alert, didn't even make the first round for me at this time. Guys like, um, I don't know who else you'll have to see as we go through this mock draft. But Derek Brown helps out the Colts significantly. They need an interior force. And that's exactly what Derek Brown brings to the table. A guy that's surprisingly good at getting after the quarterback, given his sides. But he is, in my opinion, a top three run stuffer in this class. He is an incredibly good player at Auburn. And he's a freak that can just get after the QB, shut down the run. A player that in a lot of other draft classes would be a top 10 pick. And he falls all the way to number 19. Colts get better on the defensive line. And so do the Titans. Kind of. They're in a 3-4 system right now, and they're in a bit of an odd spot because Brian Arakpo is now 33, 34 years old. I believe he's an impending free agent. I know for a fact that Derek Morgan, who's also getting older, is an impending free agent. Wesley Woodyard, don't know what his contract situation is, but I can tell you that he's certainly getting older, um, although he is an inside linebacker, and the 
Titans, while needing an inside linebacker, I think need an edge rusher just a bit more. They took Harold Landry, which was incredible value. I can't believe he fell all the way um, to the second round. He was absolutely a first-round talent, and the Titans got a stud and a steal when they drafted him um, about midway through the second round last year. But you need to get another player on the other side. Again, Brian Ra Arakpo is not going to be there next year. Derek Morgan is not going to be there next year. What else do you have? Jayon Brown is a guy that's played well for the Titans at middle linebacker recently. I don't think it's your biggest need. And it's between probably inside linebacker and edge rusher. Montez Sweat out of Mississippi State is probably the best edge rusher on the board. I think even though the defensive line talent is so good up to this point, it's better on the interior. And the edge rushers at number 20 are starting to become a little bit worse. So Montez Sweat, who's probably not a first round player in my opinion right now, could, you know, play up to that value for sure. But he ends up going at number 20. Mississippi State product, great player. Titans get themselves a pretty good value pick here at number 20. And number 21, another Mississippi State guy. And I hope you guys understood what I meant with Montez Sweat uh, and maybe not having that first round value, but based on the positional value and based on him having a higher ceiling could be a guy that goes here hope you understood that but jeffrey simmons another guy how in the world does he fall at 21 well a lot of other defensive tackles are going a lot of other teams need other positions and they can wait on defensive tackle jeffrey simmons falls to the minnesota vikings who have a number of needs this is a team that was expected to come out in 2018 play like they did in 2017 and really really play well and they haven't They've been poor, and I think a big reason for that has been their abysmal offensive line. But also, you look to the defensive side of the ball, and Linval Joseph is a player that's coming up to the end of his contract. He's also 30 years old. You look at Sheldon Richardson. He is an impending free agent. He also offers a number of off-field question marks, if you're the Minnesota Vikings. And what else do you have on the inside? If you don't have Linval Joseph coming back, which... I think is unlikely, but it's a possibility. And you don't have Sheldon Richardson coming back. Are you going to start Tom Johnson, who's 34 years old? I don't think so. I know he has four and a half sacks this year. Not bad for a defensive tackle, but you can't do that. You need to replace these guys that you're not going to have next year. And I don't think Sheldon Richardson is going to re-sign with the Vikings. I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. So you need to go out and if you have a guy like Jeffrey Simmons that falls all the way to 21 when he's a top 10 player, probably, you have to jump on that. You have to get all over that and say, hey, we'll address some of our other needs in the second, third round, fourth round, maybe. This is a player that we cannot afford to pass on. As we take another player that fell, Rashawn Gary. Here's why he fell for me. A lot of players need edge rushers. Some, some analysts, some players, some people... A bunch of guys consider Rashawn Gary to be an edge rusher. When you turn on the tape, this is an athlete and an athlete first. He's not a very technical player, and he's a guy that hasn't performed all that well on the edge. He's been double teamed a lot, and he hasn't been that impact playmaker for the Michigan uh, Wolverines. He hasn't been. But, again, when you talk about athletic profile, you talk about his size to speed to ability ratio— he is fantastic. Absolutely a first-round player. But I think on the inside, I have him listed at D-line and not edge or not D-end because I think he translates well as a defensive tackle in a 4-3 or a defensive end in a 3-4. If I'm the 49ers, right, who have taken players like Rashawn Gary, scheme fit-wise, in Solomon Thomas, and Eric Armstead, and they've tried to play him on the edge and it hasn't worked, I think the exact same thing would happen. Don't take Rashawn Gary and play him at edge, please. Please rotate him into play on the inside. Do what the Broncos did with Derek Wolf. Do what they've done with Malik Jackson or what they did with him. Please play Rashawn Gary as a 3-4 defensive end. Please play him as a 4-3 defensive tackle. Do not play him as the edge because you are wasting potentially an insane player. Ravens need help on the inside, and a lot of guys would go, hey, no they don't. They have Michael Pierce. Michael Pierce is an incredible player. Why would they take another, if you're saying defensive tackle, they also have Brandon Williams, who's been a great nose tackle for them. Well, Michael Pierce and Brandon Williams are both nose tackles. They both are nose tackles. They're not great interior pass rushers. 
And when you look at the other defensive linemen that start for the Ravens, it's bad. You have Brent Urban and Chris Wormley on the defensive line, not to mention Patrick Ricard, who is a fullback playing defensive tackle or a defensive tackle that played fullback. Either way, it's not a great defensive line on the inside outside of Brandon Williams and Michael Pierce. And when you play a lot of down linemen on the inside and you're in that 3-4 system and you have T-Sizzle coming off the edge and to Darius Smith, Tim Williams, Matthew Judon coming off the edge, you have a lot of guys that are, uh, play on the inside. And if Rashawn Gary falls all the way down the board to the Ravens here, he would fit their system insanely well on the inside. Whether they take him or not is a different story. I think it'd be a fantastic pick. So I have mocked him to the Ravens here at number 22. Steelers, I'm going to make this short and sweet. They need a cornerback very badly. Very badly. Byron Murphy is a good cornerback. He's accelerated up draft boards with a fantastic season. He's excelled last year at Washington. He's played very, very well. He should be a first-round player. I think he's going to continue to get that hype, and he will end up being a first-round player. He goes to the Steelers here at number 23. And at number 24, the Raiders take Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. With their second pick, they have one more here in the first round. But this is a player that you take for versatility. Because you can play him at cornerback, where they maybe have a need. You can play him at safety, where they have a need. Because if you look at the Raiders' depth chart, it's pretty bad. They're one of the worst teams overall in football. And a big reason for that, in my opinion, is the secondary. I like Gary and Conley, so you take him. He's CB1, maybe. And I like Carl Joseph who apparently the Raiders are trying to trade, but he's safety one, strong safety. Outside of that, you have Marcus Gilchrist at free safety. He is not a starting caliber player, and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson is a guy that would be playing free safety in the NFL, in my opinion. I don't think he should play cornerback. But if you don't like Daryl Worley, Nicholas Morrow, or Nick Nelson at cornerback 2-3-4, I think maybe you go with Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. You can play him at cornerback and see how he plays. They need a defensive back. This is a guy that fills one of two needs, if not both, in certain packages. So the Raiders get themselves a versatile stud here at number 24. And rounding out the first round with the Seahawks going Trayvon Diggs, brother of Stefan Diggs. It'd be really cool if they played in the same division. But this is a guy that fills a classic Seahawks need. They like big physical cornerbacks. And maybe with Trayvon Diggs, you're not getting a big physical cornerback. But you're getting a guy that fits that frame that you've shown that you've liked. Six foot two, 200 ish pounds. He's a player that the Seahawks traditionally have gone after. When I say with that frame at cornerback, you look at the guys they've played Brandon Browner, six foot four. Richard Sherman, six foot three. Shaquille Griffin has had some good size. Or I, do, he, I guess he still does, as a, he's six foot one. They like these big cornerbacks, and they don't have someone playing consistently well opposite of Shaquille Griffin, who has played well. So you need to improve that position if the Seattle Seahawks going into this draft. You need to get another cornerback that isn't named Trey Flowers, that isn't named Justin Coleman. They're okay players. Trayvon Diggs is a true number one, and he would work really well as CB2 with the Seahawks here. And I think he's a player that they've tra uh, traditionally gone after with that, with that size, with that frame. As the Raiders go Paris Campbell, I did this in my last draft, but it still makes a lot of sense to me. You go defense with your first two picks, and then you go with a burner. And again, big playmaker, can stretch the field, fantastic speed, probably some of the best in this entire draft class. Paris Campbell is incredibly fast, and he gives you an amazing weapon if you're John Gruden running that offense. Because currently, with the Raiders, you don't have that burner. Look at how well the Chiefs have utilized Tyreek Hill. This wasn't an insane receiver coming into the draft this was an insane college receiver it was insane swiss army knife he was an insane playmaker but he's developed into that receiver and with the raiders they don't have a guy that stretches the field jordy nelson no seth roberts no marcel aitman absolutely not he's a red zone threat i love marcel aitman he was in my list of draft steals as he went like the seventh round but here's a guy you guys like that, Chris Collinsworth? Here's a guy, John Madden, whoever would say that. I think both of them have. That can stretch the field for you, give you a playmaker over the top. Maybe it'll make Derek Carr look better than he is, as we saw in the beginning of his career. Shots fired, not a franchise quarterback. Texans take Chris Lindstrom out of BC. Offensive guard, you need help on the inside. You need help on the entire offensive line. Lindstrom's the guy that's going to rise up draft boards. 
especially maybe being the top guard in this class. Wouldn't be shocked to see him go here in the first round. One thing in my mind is certain, and that's that the Texans are taking offensive line in the first round. I don't see them taking any other position. Maybe safety because Kareem Jackson is going to be a free agent. Maybe don't re-sign Tyre Matthew, but they need offensive line help badly. Lindstrom offers you that, uh, that as the Chargers go. Raekwon Davis, another Alabama player on the inside. Really, the Chargers just have edge rushers. When Joey Bose is healthy, he's incredible. When Melvin Ingram's playing, he's incredible. You need help on the inside. Brandon Meebane is coming up to the end of his tenure in Los Angeles with the Chargers, and you need someone playing better than him anyway. Raekwon Davis, versatile guy with nose tackle size. Like, can play nose tackle, can play defensive tackle, depending on the scheme. Very good player. Probably should be going way higher, but with all the defensive tackles, he falls all the way to 28. As we have another defensive tackle here, Christian Wilkins going to the Patriots out of Clemson. Another defensive tackle that's incredible. Would be probably going in the top 15, top 20 of last draft, but he decided to go back to Clemson for another year. Patriots who need help on the inside of their defensive line get themselves a really good player. As the Rams go with an inside linebacker, Mac Wilson out of Alabama. You need help at inside linebacker. A lot of players, or a lot of people, I always, I keep saying players, excuse me. A lot of people have liked some of the play of the, Ra or, me, the Rams inside linebackers this year, but it hasn't been good. I don't know what games are watching where you think Corey Littleton and Mark Barron are acceptable starting inside linebackers. I've, I've had these Corey Littleton fanboys coming at me on my last mock draft. Corey Littleton is not good. Well, look at all his tackles. Corey Littleton is such a liability in run defense, it isn't even funny. You are giving up so many yards because he can't come up and make tackles. He waits, and he gets them down the field, and then he wraps up. He's 225 pounds as an inside linebacker with decent speed, nothing crazy. He's not an impact stuffer in the run game. He isn't a guy that's going to stop the run. Mac Wilson, 6'2", 240 plus could return to Alabama for another year but if he doesn't he should be a first round pick and he's going to arguably one of the best teams in football here great situation for him at the end of the first round going to the Rams as Jonathan Abram another Mississippi State player going in the first round three Mississippi State players is this a joke no well he's actually a really really solid player and part of what's made this defense so good you have these guys like Jeffrey Simmons and Montez Sweat that have been awesome on the D-line. Who's holding up the entire back end? Jonathan Abram. He's a guy with good coverability. Can come down and play the run. A true safety. Really talented player. I, I think he's going to rise up draft boards a lot as well um, post-combine. And when guys watch more tape on him. Because this tape is pretty good. I would recommend watching it. Turn on Mississippi State. Watch him exclusively. He is a playmaker. He does everything right. Could be a guy that ends up going in the first round. But things get a little wonky near the end of the first as, uh, I mean, they usually do. And another Clemson defensive lineman in the first round to wrap things up. Chiefs go Dexter Lawrence. Another huge body defensive tackle that can play nose, but has a surprising ability to get after the quarterback. I think a lot of that is actually because of the players that he plays next to. Opposite of what I said about Cleveland Farrell, because I'm not taking anything away from him. But... Dexter Lawrence is 350 pounds. He is insanely big, a great run stuffer, and even though he doesn't have the sack numbers, his interior pressures have been a beauty to watch. I, I don't understand how he does it at his weight, at his size, but I guess that's going to do it for the first round here, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more, and I will see you in the next one. Take it easy. Yeah. Okay.